This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, from Philadelphia to Erie and from Scranton to Pittsburgh, it's Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior uh, Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mara Donnelly. Mara, welcome. Hello, Charlie. Why, it's springtime, and Pennsylvania uh, in the spring means flowers and potholes. potholes. Have you run <laughs> into any of them lately? I've run over several of them, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a little unavoidable but, this time you, of year. So you don't think we exaggerate? Uh, no, oh no, no, no. And I think we have an expert here who can tell us why why we have such terrible bottles. <laughs> and I'm glad that we I'm glad we have such a such a person that we can consult with. Bob, welcome back to the show. Our guest today is Robert Latham, who's the executive vice president uh, of the Associated Pennsylvania Constructors. And uh, if there's anyone that knows roads and construction, it's you, Bob. <laughs> Good to be here, Charlie. Well, it's nice and, to have uh, you back. Uh, and get to field the pothole questions, that's fine. Um, you said earlier you want to know why we have potholes. Why? Um, Springtime former, in <laughs> former Secretary of Transportation Brad Mallory put it this way, the, the state of Pennsylvania is old, cold, and it's wet. And, uh, and those, thre those three things uh, mixed together cause freeze thaw, and when ice and when water freezes, it expands, and that's not good for pavement, and that's really the, uh, the long and short of it. Uh, I guess the other thing I can say is, looking at our location, you have a lot of states that don't have the kind of through traffic that we have here in Pennsylvania. We're the Keystone State. Every truck that gets from New England uh, to anywhere else in the country or the New York ports, anywhere else in the country goes across here. When you put 80, 90,000 pound trucks on, on concrete that's freezing and thawing, uh, bad things happen. Which is why, which is why the General Assembly and, uh, and the administration a couple of years ago uh, recognized that we need to invest in our infrastructure. We need to continue to invest in it. It's just like your driveway at home. Uh, if you don't seal it, if you don't repair it occasionally, what does it do? It falls apart and the roads are the same way. Uh, so hopefully, with the new funding from Act 89, we're going to start to get a handle on not only the potholes, but also the, uh, uh, sub, some of the substandard bridges so that we can continue to make improvements there as well. And, and we've tried, Mara and I have tried on um, the show to uh, keep the public up to date with uh, infrastructure financing and infrastructure repairs, but I think most Pennsylvanians are now realizing that we have the highest gas taxes in the nation, is that right? Uh, we, as, as as well, when you do the equivalency of our of our Act 89, which we actually did away with what we call the gas tax at the pump, but when moved it upstream to what we call the oil company franchise tax. Now, if you do those calculations uh, to uh, what that would mean if it were still a cents per gallon, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I would add um, that 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 calculation would show us, for example, at about 20 cents per gallon higher than the state of Maryland. And if you go down below the border, you look at about a five to seven cents per gallon discrepancy in the cost of, 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 of gas at the pump. So some of that gets absorbed in the, uh, in the market. Um, so, so consumers are not seeing all of that relative to them at the pump. What they are seeing, or what they're going to see hopefully soon, is vast improvements in the highway system as a result of that investment. Well, it's that time of year, too, so there is a lot of construction going on. So right, every time exactly. I fill up, I think to myself, this will take care of repairing that pothole I drove through. <laughs> the, old, the old joke that the state flower is the orange barrel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, although it's, we don't put orange barrels yeah. at it anymore. <laughs> cones. Yeah, orange cones, right. that's for sure. Well, we have, uh, I know there's some federal funding that comes into Pennsylvania. Okay, we'll talk and about that. so we've got some issues going on there with passage of the federal funding. Can you, can you bring us up to speed on that? Well, like I said, two years ago, we got our act together here in Pennsylvania. And a lot of states have done the same thing. They've had to kind of to pick up the ball and run with it because Congress uh, has been slow to act. Um, starting with the building of the interstate highway system, we created this federal highway trust fund. It's evolved over the years to, to fund uh, the, the, the national share of roads, uh, public transit, and then also some alternative transportation programs like uh, streetscapes, bicycle facilities, uh, walkable communities, and that sort of thing. Those are all very important and all, 
all ties together. And if you'll recall, at the federal level, those of you who uh, study history, those of your, your viewers who study history, um, one of the initial federal uh, um, things that the federal government was to do were, uh, was transportation. I mean, when the Constitution was formed, lighthouses were one of the first things that the national government funded. Why? Because of transportation. President Lincoln, uh, although known for the Emancipation Proclamation and a lot of things, his major, major accomplishment was getting internal improvements. He wanted to build that railroad from, from coast to coast. Why? Because it was vital to the to the uh, to the growth and the well-being and the and the quality of life of people in the in the country, so we now have the highway program and uh, and it and it expires every several years. Well, it's due to expire this year and it's woefully underfunded and it's really Congress needs to do something about it. In fact, even though Pennsylvania has uh, increased its share of uh, state funding, we still rely on. Uh, the federal government for more than 40 percent of our capital monies. So what, without that federal program, we would really be falling behind, as would all the states. So it's very important that Congress act by May 31st. Oh, that the, soon. That's the that deadline. Quickly. You know, okay. May 31st. How, how's it looking? Uh, Anybody talking about it down there? Yes, it is. Okay. As a matter of fact, I gotta, we have to give uh, great credit to our, our own Pennsylvania congressional delegation because um, earlier in the year, uh, there was a, a letter that was being circulated, uh, a bipartisan letter being sent to both the minority leader Nancy Pelosi and Speaker John Boehner, uh, urging them to, to get behind a comprehensive transfer, a long-term comprehensive transportation bill, and every member of the, of the Pennsylvania congressional delegation signed it. I would say the average was maybe 50% to, to two-thirds of, uh, of state delegations. They got, you know, a, a majority of congressmen to say, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to vote for, for long-term funding, but every one of our delegation members uh, voted for it. Um, so we have people uh, representing us in Congress that, that really understand the importance of this. Um, we're very fortunate to have the House uh, Transportation Infrastructure Chairman, Bill Schuster, who had, was uh, recently, um, back in April, visited the state, went across the state with a number of other congressmen and, and some de uh, state uh, uh, transportation commissioners and secretaries, uh, calling attention to to the need to do this, we have Congressmen uh, uh, Kelly and Meehan, who are both on Ways and Means, really working with the uh, Ways and Means Chairman Paul Ryan to try to come up with uh, what in Washington they call pay fors or how how are we going to pay for all this? So we have a, a very strong leadership role at uh, with our uh, particularly with our House delegation in, in this uh, regard. Well, it seems that Pennsylvania has taken. Um more of an initiative, more of a role, uh, or uh, has confronted this issue more directly than the federal government, Bob. When you look at um, our gas tax works out to, what, about 51.6 cents per gallon, mm -hmm. uh, which was driven by Act 89 of 2013. The federal gas tax is only 18.4 cents per gallon and hasn't been increased since 1993. Um, what's happening in Washington? They don't see the need for road maintenance, or uh, what's what's happening? Well, I think unfortunately in Washington uh, we have not been able to get past sort of this this stalemate that uh, that there is a uh, that there is a huge uh, pushback from the public on uh, transportation investment. 1993 goes back to the Clinton it goes back uh, a long, It goes back a long way. Yeah. Um, personally, I believe there are two things that have to happen for, uh, for a bill like this to happen. One is you need strong leadership from the executive. We saw all that uh, with the, the Corbett administration. We saw all that with the Rendell administration um, in terms of, of getting out in front of legislation. Uh, and working with the General Assembly on a, or in this case, Congress, on a realistic plan. We have not really seen that uh, of the, in, the, in the two most recent presidential uh, 
uh, administrations. The, the Bush administration was all about private investment, which can only go so far. Um, the Obama administration wants to tax all offshore profits, which is really kind of a smoke and mirrors thing, and then you know it all sort of dissolves from there. The other thing is uh, we've been trying to encourage members of Congress to understand that the public is really further out in front of this than they, than they think they are. All of our polling shows, for example, that 90% of people agree that investment is de definitely necessary. More than 50% are willing to pay up to $10 a month more in order to invest and have safety, convenience, and quality of life in their communities. When you, know, when you ask them, would you rather be, feel safe driving around or save $10 a month? I mean, people say, no, I'd rather, I'd rather know the bridges are safe. I'd rather know that we can fix that intersection that's, that's kind of dangerous and that stretch of road that really ought to be widened. Uh, that that can be done, and uh, we can maybe uh, fix our interstates a little bit. So when I, uh, you know, when I get out on our interstate system here in Pennsylvania, we know that uh, we're not going to get run over by a truck. I mean, th th those kind of things resonate with people. For some reason, Congress and, and our national leaders really haven't gotten to that point yet. Well, but I think we're starting to see that now with some of the action, particularly the leadership from our delegation, as they see the popularity of Act 89 here in Pennsylvania. Well, what's the direct impact going to be on Pennsylvania if the funding either falls short or doesn't pass at all? Well, the direct impact will be, uh, you know, we'll be almost back to where we were prior to Act 89. We won't be able to fix as many bridges. We certainly won't be able to do major projects. I mean, one of the things about Act 89 is this is not a new road building program. This is this fixing fix. what we've got. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, there aren't going to be a lot of uh, sexy projects. There's not going to be a lot of marquee things happening. You're not going to see paving through what we call greenfield paving. You're going to see some a little bit of uh, widening on certain interstates. Uh, there's one or two major projects that we're looking at from Act 89. One is the finally the completion of 322 into State College, uh, which is a very uh, vital uh, project. Also uh, in the center part of the state, uh, connecting uh, um, Route 11 and 15 with uh, with I-80 and up to up to New York, uh, what they call the Central Susquehanna Valley Expressway. Um, that's about it. The rest of this is all, I mean, we're spending a lot of money in the Philadelphia region on I-95, as your viewers from there can, can attest, because there's a lot of work going yeah. on there. That's just fixing the existing road. That's not doing anything, uh, you know, to uh, increase capacity or anything like yeah, that. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, and we're just... Uh, we're getting warmed we're up. Yeah, we're just <laughs> getting warmed up, and uh, I feel like we're making progress repairing these roads. But uh, thank you very much, you Bob, for being with us today. We hope to see you back here shortly for an update on the uh, uh, progress that's being made. Uh, Our pleasure. We'll be at this coming to the second segment of Behind the Headlines right after this. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state and by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions to make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Express, transporting construction, farm, and industrial equipment throughout the United States. And by Blackford Ventures LLC, a private equity firm seeking to make significant investments in real estate, proven business enterprises, and their leaders. Find out more at www.blackfordventures.com and by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Headlines. On this segment, Maura and I are going to be talking about some of the new issues regarding technology that are in the uh, news lately. For example, uh, we've heard that the White House uh, was hacked by the uh, Russians. And the Russians got into the president's email and was able to read some of this. 
Now, this is interesting when we look at what Hillary was doing as Secretary of State regarding email, Mara. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, there have been some crazy things going on, and I think we're fortunate today, today to have an expert in cybersecurity with us. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity from a financial perspective with Jim Deitch, who is the principal at Terra Verde Ventures. And yeah. a board member a of board member. Susquehanna mm -hmm. Valley yeah. Center. Yeah. Welcome back, Jim. Good. Thank you. Very excited to have you. I'm a little bit of a geek, so I'm going to I'm gonna have a lot of questions <laughs> okay. for you. I hope we have enough time. Um, you know, as a... I've, you know, we see every, every time you open up the newspaper or turn on the TV, there are uh, new uh, breaches occurring. Mm -hmm. um, we as consumers feel them when we're impacted by them, and our banks have to send us new credit cards or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Uh, but there's a bigger level of this going on in all of our financial institutions. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what's happening? What's happening out there with cybersecurity? Well, you, you see a, a lot of headline news about breaches by uh, in, into financial institutions and also, also healthcare institutions. And they're fairly pervasive because it's so easy to do. It's just so easy to get in. Okay, so why? Why is it so easy? Well, you know, typically attackers don't go in through the firewall. They don't go in through the perimeter security. They usually go in through a method called social engineering. And social engineering uh, can take a variety of forms. It can be as simple as an email coming in that has malicious code attached to it. Mm -hmm. When someone clicks on it, that malicious code is then inserted into their computer. Generally, it's a keylogger or other type of device that allows the activities of that user to be exported outside of the perimeter. And once you open that up, you begin to get passwords and expand your access across, across and, the network. And that's an example of what happened to Sony, correct? Yes. Where somebody in Sony, you know, unknowingly opened up an email that just, and then all hell broke loose. Right. <laughs> okay. and, and, and typically, it's not the emails that are from a person in Nigeria asking you to claim $5 billion. <laughs> I, I get those <laughs> daily. <laughs> it, it's an email that looks legitimate. Right. It either comes from an executive of the company or it comes from a known vendor or another source that's mm -hmm. believed to be trusted. Um, I work with a company that recently had something similar happen to them where the, a request for a transfer of funds came in from what looked like one of their clients. And they began the process and started transferring the funds. And it turns out it was they were transferring funds to somebody they didn't even know. And thankfully, they, they caught it very quickly. And on the bank on the other end stopped, mm -hmm. stopped the process. But when they called the FBI, called everybody, they, not that they didn't care, but there's so many bigger things happening. This was mm -hmm. a very small company. So this type of thing can happen to very small companies, too, not just the Sonys of the world and not just the large financial institutions. Right, right. We know, Jim, that there are people that are working overtime uh, in Russia and in the Middle East uh, that are trying to hack into international financial networks 24-7. Um, what kind of headway have they been making and what can you tell our average viewer uh, in terms of what can they do to protect themselves and how concerned should the average viewer be about um, cybersecurity in their own accounts? So I think the, the first thing in the digital world is, is whatever you do, the minute you put it in an email or type it on a computer, it's forever and it can be discovered. So that information is pervasive and whatever you have gets recorded forever. I think the CEO of Sony found that out yes. uh, kind of the hard way. <laughs> it's, still, it's still bubbling up for yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. And, and even uh, our, our former Secretary of State, by essentially erasing or destroying a server, you can, you can eliminate one side of it, but those emails went somewhere. So mm -hmm. the other side of that email still exists, and my guess is will eventually uh, be recovered. But typically, the, the consumer uh, can protect themselves in a couple of ways. One is, whenever you're using public Wi-Fi, uh, you have a, a certain element of risk. So when we go out and test the security of a business, one of the things that our uh, operatives will do is set up a Wi-Fi uh, transmitter that spoofs a known legitimate type of, of uh, uh, Wi-Fi access point, so ATT Wireless, Xfinity, it will broadcast being that, that particular name of that, that router. 
some of the uh, phones, like, like an iPhone or, or your personal devices, are set to automatically connect to known networks. Mm -hmm. So when you connect to that network, you have a, an attack which is known as man in the middle, that, that, that uh, spoofed Wi-Fi access point acts as the man in the middle and watches everything that goes across that particular data stream. So when someone logs into their email using a username and password, it passes through that, that access point, it is picked up by software, and now the, the, the hacker has the username and password for email. Once you have the username and password for email, you can go in by the web and get all kinds of information about that particular target. This is, this is how generally the, the breaches uh, can, can be done against businesses, is you start by hacking email accounts of a business, you then go in and, and know who is likely to be sending the target an email, you spoof that email with a payload attached to it, and when the user opens that email and clicks on the attachment, then that malicious code is inserted. And generally, virus programs, antivirus programs, can't always pick it up. What are, what are companies doing about this? So one, I hope a lot, but what are they well, doing? Well, there, there's there, there's a lot of things that are company uh, that companies are doing, and 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 first of all, the you know the perimeter security for most installations is is very strong. Within that network and within that perimeter, there are tools that monitor the types of information coming in and out. So, for instance, in the Sony case, a lot of data was exfiltrated uh, through their networks. And the monitoring that, that Sony employed wasn't as effective to say, why is all this information coming out and where is it going? Oh. So there are, are devices and software that will monitor the exfiltration of data. And if it looks to be moving out in a large quantity, it instantly is stopped. So there are fairly effective defenses of doing this. But typically what happens is when you, when you lose control of your email account and then get spoofed, um, the, 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 the hackers trying to see what your credentials are to log into a work computer. And once you're inside the network and appear to be a legitimate user with a login and a password, you can then kind of expand your access and begin to explore the network, insert more code. And from that point, you can begin to expand and travel across the network. So, uh, you know, the spoofing with a, with a Wi-Fi is one way. Uh, there's another thing that's called a candy drop. Candy drop. A candy drop. Sounds what is good. That? So, <laughs> what is that? Sounds like it would be something good. <laughs> well, it, it is if you're a hacker. So a candy drop is is usually taking a USB thumb drive okay. and labeling it with the logo of a company and putting things like executive salary package, reduction in force, merger plans, and leaving that in the public areas of a company. Typically, an employee will find it and it's curiosity, like, curiosity gets the best of them, <laughs> and they put it in to a, a USB port, and then that that information, uh, the, the information on there is bogus. But what happens is yeah. malware is inserted upon the insertion of the stick drive. Well, I know we keep going back to Sony because oh, it's one of the biggest biggest uh, ones out there. But um, I I saw or read that they stopped emailing. Well, I, I think what, For a while what happened or was permanently? well, not not permanently, <laughs> but but the when you get a malware inserted on your your uh, network, it's very hard sometimes to clean it off. And I think at the end of the day, in order to prevent the the continued spread or reinfection of that malware, the uh, email services within a company may be temporarily suspended just so people aren't emailing back and forth, which then While they're trying to clean it tends up. to propagate yeah. the, okay. the infection. Jim, do we have any idea on what the total losses might be for consumers or businesses or both in Pennsylvania per year due to cyber uh, hacking? Or nationally, do we have any estimates on that? So uh, a couple of estimates. The, the American Bankers Association estimated that the losses for banks that are community banks and, and, and mid-sized banks are roughly uh, whatever is stolen, 50% of it's recovered, 50% of it the bank absorbs in terms of costs. And when you look at credit card hacks, a lot of the costs of reissuing the cards of, of transactions that ultimately proved to be fraudulent flow right back on to the issue of that credit card. So the number is very, very large. And one of the things the banking industry is seeking to do 
is to say that when you're a retailer and if you don't have state-of-the-art terminals that prevent the takeover and the loss of that credit card information, why should the bank essentially indemnify the customers or make the customers hold at their expense when the cause of the loss was really located out at Target, Home Depot, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of discussion going on back and forth about ultimately who bears that cost. The consumer doesn't bear a cost of a fraudulent transaction. And in part, that's one of the reasons that, that some in the banking industry say fraud is so prevalent because mm -hmm. the consumer doesn't necessarily take the types of precautions uh, to associate a PIN or a zip code with their credit card every time it's used because it's inconvenient. Yeah. I, I suspect that there's a lot going on out there that we don't even, that we never hear about. Is that correct? Uh, I, I would say that's true. Okay. Uh, we probably don't want to know about it. But isn't it just absolutely frightening, though, that foreign governments are involved in this? And w we may be doing it ourselves, too, but the fact that the foreign governments are actively hacking <laughs> is, is just terrifying. Well, it, it's another dimension of, of warfare, and whether it starts as a simmering conflict, the ability of really anybody anywhere to move into a target and attempt to breach a target on United States soil or really anywhere is, is just escalating. So yeah. the, the defenses are escalating, the, the attack vectors are escalating, and it, it is a game of, of cat and mouse. I, I think I'm going to put all my money in, under my mattress now. <laughs> or, or put it in Bitcoin. Right? Yeah, or Bitcoin. <laughs> we have to have, bit, have you back to talk about Bitcoin some more. But. Uh, an update. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us briefly in the last minute, uh, do, is Pennsylvania state government doing anything that you know of or you can talk about to increase state cybersecurity? I, I think the, the, the state that is leading the way is New York State. Um, so uh, the, the New York State uh, authorities, Ben Lasky, uh, Benjamin Lasky, uh, has really put an awful lot of effort into ensuring that financial institutions, mortgage bankers, anybody that touches the financial services business have adequate controls and adequate security in place. And I, I would view New York as, as being at the leading edge, even in some cases ahead of what the federal government is doing with respect to uh, cyber security. Are we bringing awesome. that technology, uh, that uh, information and expertise to Pennsylvania, Jim? Uh, I, I think it's too early to tell what, what uh, our, our new governor will be up to. He's got his hands full with so many things, but, uh, but New York is leading the way. Okay. All right. Well, we, Maura and I want to thank you okay. very much for being thank with you. us today, and we look forward to having you back very soon. Um, we look forward to being back with you next week on a new edition of Behind the Headlines. We'll see you then.